We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of life who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us. Now, we can't even tell sometimes what life is bringing us. Times are changing. And there's some things that are going to be forever remain the same. But yet we have to be ready for it all. Open your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3. We want to read the first eight verses of chapter 3 of the book of Ecclesiastes. And the Bible reads, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What makes human beings different from every other species of created life? Is man any better than the rest of God's creatures? Or he, uh, is he just another animal like the beast, the birds, and the fish? An abundance of people, even educated ones, believe that man is just another animal. And that there is nothing special about him. But what does God have to say on the subject? In the 8th Psalm, verses 4 through 8, the psalmist asks the question, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of, of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea. And the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. God says that man has been created as a higher being than animals. Of God's created beings, angels are higher 
more powerful order than human beings and animals occupy a lower order than humans. God has given man dominion, authority, power over the rest of his earthly creation. In addition, God has crowned man with the glory and honor that animals do not have. This great fact gives meaning and purpose and value to human life that no other other uh, created species possess. Finding purpose and fulfillment in life begins with understanding that God has added value and significance to our lives that he did not bestow on any of his other creatures. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon teaches us that God's ultimate plan for the human race rises above all the disappointments and dissatisfactions that are so common on earth. Notice there are four great gifts from God that set apart people or set people apart from the rest of God's creatures. And I want us this morning just to mention one of those gifts. We're looking at the first verse, or rather, yes, the first verse of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Look at God's great gift of time and life. And then we're going to answer a question that was asked of me. You see, God's great gift of time and life, what makes people different, more valuable than every other species? You see, for human time and life differ from that of every other created being. And though every creature of God has its purpose, God added a greater dimension to the life of man. And Solomon explains it. And he says, everything has a time and season. Everything has a time and season. Solomon begins this chapter by stating a very basic fact. There is a time or season for everything and also a time for every purpose or activity in man's life on earth. Now think about this statement for a moment. It is one that is often quoted, but not always understood. I want to thank a particular brother this morning for calling me this week, asking me a question with, with somebody else. Questions are so important, and every question is important. Remember what we have just read. There is a time, but notice what God has done. He said there's a time to born and a time to die. God has regulated that, but God has left a distance in between birth and death. That is in man's control. Man is supposed to make some decisions in his life between his birth and his death. But first of all, man has to believe in this God we are talking about. How can we, how should we look at the issue of deathbed salvation. It's an important question. Many people are asking this question. Can I call upon God on my deathbed to be saved? And will God save me on my deathbed? Can a person be saved on his deathbed? Can a person come to Christ after a lifetime of gross sin? Remember again, a time to born and a time to die. Now let's go over to chapter 12 now. Listen to what Solomon says as he looks at the conclusion. He says, listen to what he says. Remember now 
You hear me? Remember now the creator in the days of thy youth because the evil days are coming when you're not going to be able to make such decisions so easily. You get the point now? Solomon said there are time to delay, a time to born, and a time to die. And he says the best time to remember God is in your youth because they're going to come sometime when you're not going to be able to. And sometimes, one of those times is on your deathbed when you can no longer obey God. We'll get to that later. So can a person come to God on his deathbed? Can a person come to Christ after a lifetime of gross sins? What's the answer? Many of us have heard sermons or read books and tracts in which the speaker or writer describes an experience of someone who lived his life a her life in sin. And at the moment of death, they uttered a sinner's prayer. Remember, we have not even come yet to the real doctrines. We're just looking at some facts from the book of Ecclesiastes. A time to born and a time to die. And Solomon says, remember now the creator in the days of thy youth before the evil days come. See, this sort of experience that these preachers talk about is given to assure us that it is never too late to be saved. <laughs> that is true. Thus God has always offered salvation until the very end, until the very last moment of death. <laughs> this is meant to offer comfort to those who are alive and those who have lost a loved one in death. So here's a question for you. Have you heard of someone's salvation or heard of someone's salvation at the point of death? You see, in many cases, we can see through what is happening. It may be a man has lived his life apart from God, separated from all spiritual interests, cold to the things of Christ, sometimes even hostile to the mention of his need for salvation. Then this person comes down with an incurable illness and arrives at the point of death. An interested son or daughter or maybe an eager preacher or priest then tries to urge this person to make a decision for Christ. And I'm going to give you reasons why this decision or this experience has some real errors in them, some faults in them. Because when you are dying in pain, you're not thinking of repentance. When you're dying in pain, you're not thinking of the sins you have committed. Somebody has come to you and said, man, you just need to get it right. Let me pray for you. But the, the, the point out to us that God will soon be the judge. Uh, we'll be judged by a righteous God. And thus we need to call on the name of the Lord for salvation. They emphasize that God won't turn such a person away. But again, here's something you need to remember. According to Acts chapter 8, when Peter talked to Simon, uh, Simon the sorcerer, after he had tried to purchase the Holy Spirit, and he wanted now to change immediately, Peter made a statement to him. He says, perhaps if the thought of your heart... In other words, son, you better start thinking right. There may come a time when you can't think right. You have forfeited all those years, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, all those years, and now you can't think right. All you see is hell's fire. 
Just some thoughts. So preachers give people the idea, well, God is a loving God, and God will not send a person like that to hell. I don't know. It's true, he is the judge. But there's one thing we know. That God has already given the order and the formula for salvation. And God has not changed his word. If God has not changed his word, you and I don't have the authority to change them in order to accommodate somebody. God's word are forever true and they are sealed. God hasn't done any changing. Man has his responsibility between life and death. Solomon said, remember now. Because sometimes they're going to come when you can't change. And Peter says again to Simon, if perhaps the thoughts of your heart be forgiven you. Now we don't want to minimize any of the good things that this scenario we have given showed us. But sadly, there are many elements that are less, less than good. There are questions that need to be asked. Did this person really understand the meaning of sin, the extent of sin, and the present and eternal results of sin? Was the person broken hearted and regretful for the years of indifference of false beliefs and practices? Did the sick person renounce the false church or religion he may have been a part of? Did the person actually place his faith in God and in Christ Jesus? Did the person really understand the reason for Christ's death on the cross and the significance of his resurrection from the dead? Did this person really intend to live differently after conversion as a new creation in Christ? Let us suppose for a minute that that person gets better. Were well, their plans for if it gets better? Because the plans are now, I'm going to die. Are there any plans for if God heals that person? No, there are no plans. I just want to get out of this situation. I just want to make my mind feel better. Furthermore, did the person actually acknowledge Jesus as Lord, the rightful ruler of life and the ruler of heaven and the earth? Did the person choose to be baptized? Someone might ask, is it possible to be baptized? In some cases, yes. Some of us will remember a brother from right here was in Tuskegee Hospital. He couldn't get up off his bed. We went to see him and he requested us to baptize him. He said, I want to be saved. And God in his mighty providence provided a way. We were there scratching our heads. How are we going to do it? And someone came and said, we have a stretcher and a pool up top. We'll put him in the stretcher and let him down. That was one of the greatest days I've ever had in preaching the word of God. To see someone who couldn't even move, allow himself to be placed on a stretcher and let down into the water and up again. Some of you might remember Brother Williams, Sister Adelaide Williams' husband. We just went to see him in Tuskegee. He was dying. But all those years he had been taught the word of God. And now, yes, he wanted opportunity. And God provided something. We didn't think about it. But here comes someone, a stranger to us, and said, we can help you. Now there's a difference. He was buried in water 
that very day. True, he didn't live very long after that, but he obeyed the gospel of Christ, the way Christ says it, and the way the apostles taught it. I have another example. There was a very personal friend of mine in New York for years. We have been talking about obeying the gospel of Christ. For years, she keep putting it back. And then we were in Enterprise. I got a call from the hospital. And she wanted me to pray for her so that she would not lose her soul. And I could not. At that time, I just didn't know how to pray that that person be saved. How could I do that? Oh, I could pray maybe that her pains may be eased, but I can pray for her salvation that she refused to obey when she could have obeyed. It made me sick for more than a week just to know I couldn't help my friend because she didn't want to obey the gospel of Christ, but now she was sick unto death. She wanted me to pray for her or salvation. There are some things that people ask of us that we just can't do. We cannot go against scripture to satisfy friendship and family who have not obeyed the word of God. We love them all. We care for them all. But there are some things we just can't do because God has not given us the permission to now, if God wants to save them in the end, that's his business. But I know God is not going to change his word. Solomon still say, remember now. Not tomorrow. Not when it gets difficult. Not when you are unable to. Remember now the creator in the days of their youth. So we are asking the question, that person who is terminally ill, can that person seek to make arrangements with the hospital staff to provide a place for, uh, for the person to be immersed in water? I don't know what the situations are. I just don't know what, what happened to us. Remember Acts 2 and verse 38 through 41. Acts 2, 38 through 41. Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call and with many other words that he testify and exhort them saying, save yourselves. From this untoward generation. That's what Peter said. Saul of Tarsus was on his knees praying. For three days and three nights. When Ananias came and said. Brother Saul receive thy sight. Arise and be baptized. And wash away thy sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Remember, one has to be baptized into Christ to put on Christ. And he cannot go where Christ is unless you put him on in baptism. The scriptures are right. And it doesn't matter what any preacher may say or do, any priest may say or do. They don't have a right to say, here is penance. No one has that right to give what God has not authorized us to give. What about all of this? Remember our time on earth is marked by diversity and fluctuation. It is not always the same. It's changing. It's unchanging. It's not monotonous. It's not simple routine. Our time on earth must be 
with some purpose. God has a purpose for us. It is up to us to look at what God's purpose is. Yes, we were, we were born and we are going to die. So what should we do in between? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the unrighteous man forsake his sins. Time to seek the Lord is now. Christ says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is always inviting. It is not death that is inviting us to change. It is Jesus. So we have to obey Jesus. The teacher Solomon was emphasizing that the very variety of events and experience in life are offered and appointed by God. God brought you here and he's going to take you out. The question is, what am I going to do in between? Have you heard preachers, uh, preachers talk about the dash <laughs> between life and death? What happens then is up to us. Because in death or after death, at the judgment, there are two places, two destinies. Heaven or hell. Tell me where you want to go. There is coming a time when you can't even make that decision because your body is racked with pain. All you want is some medication to heal your pain. Now you have strength and vitality. Now is the time to give God your life. Now is the time to turn to God. In simple terms, friends, a person's life, yes, is a variety of experiences and activities. This means a wonderful thing. God has a plan for every individual's life. Are you going to put yourself in his plan? Things do not happen by chance. God gives you opportunities. Do you squander the opportunities to turn? Don't wait till deathbed. At deathbed, you ought to be able to smile and say to your kids, turn to Christ. He has been good to me. And deathbed, you ought to be able to say, God, I'm coming. All that God says, I got a mansion for you. Now you are ready for it, not wondering whether or not you're going to get it. Don't wait until death's bed. That may never happen to you. Now is the time. To those of you who are listening to the land, we just want to ask you the question about this. What about the deathbed salvation that your preacher promised? Your preacher lied. He didn't tell you what the word of God said. He just told you what he thought. You see, we have some thoughts about God that says, well, God, uh, you say when we live, we're going to have, we should have a good time at the end of, of Ecclesiastes chapter 11 to the young people. He says, hey, take life, enjoy it. But then he said, you're going to have to give account in the end for it. And now in chapter 12, he says, what? Remember now the creator. And at the end of chapter 12, what does he say? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty. That's God's purpose for your life is to serve him. When you're not serving him, you're out of your privilege. 
So you must obey the gospel of Christ. Hear the gospel of Christ. Believe it. Christ died for your sins. Repent of your sins while you can. There may come a time when you can't. Not because God won't allow it, but because your mind might not allow it. Confess the name of Christ and be baptized. He'll wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. We want to extend to you an invitation at this time. We hope that you will come to Christ before it's too late. Come while together we stand and sing. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood.